Okay, um, welcome everybody to uh, th this afternoon's um, interdisciplinary uh, keynote lecture. It gives me great pleasure to welcome Simran Seti here to the University of Southampton. Um, it's, a, it's a subject very close to my own heart in terms of the issues surrounding food security and the various things which are going on in the world in terms of um, there's about a, a billion people who go hungry um, at the moment and, and even more if you if you consider uh, the malnutrition that's actually happening. We've got climate change acting in rather incredible ways. One of the speakers tomorrow made a calculation that if you look at the four weather sequences of key seasons of farming in the UK over um, the last two years, the probability of that sequence of weather events occurring on planet Earth is one in one and a quarter billion times. And the last time, if you go back one and a quarter billion times on planet Earth, that's when bacteria evolved. So there are these pressures, whether it be from the population, whether it be from the climate, and then you've obviously got water and energy, which forms this nexus that the government's chief scientist before, Sir John Beddington, called the perfect storm, which makes this probably one of the grandest challenges of all, and also, unfortunately, a very wicked problem. A very wicked problem to try and solve. Simran is, a, is, is renowned for her communication skills. Her, uh, she trained originally as a journalist, but then left the world of academia to work in the real world, as she called it, and to actually try and put things in action on the ground to make a difference. Um, she thinks that the only way to solve these big issues are undertaking an interdisciplinary approach, breaking down some of the silos of disciplinary boundaries and that clearly is what this week is about. So it's particularly great that she's been able to um, fit into her very busy schedule uh, to drop by the University of Southampton. Uh, Simran has named one of the top ten eco-heroes of the planet by the UK's independent newspaper and an environmental messenger by Vanity Fair. Uh, she's appeared on numerous shows, including the Oprah Winfrey show, which obviously is uh, a pretty amazing thing to have um, done. And she's also put um, a, a number of other uh, shows right around the world, the Today Show, uh, American, Australian, New Zealand, Turkey. She has appeared all over the world uh, promoting and communicating key issues to do with the environment. She has very strong links with academia, has worked and given lectures in places like um, MIT, and she is a Kelly's Distinguished Scholar in Residence at St. Catharines University in the US, which is the largest women's college in the US. She is the founder and curator of the beta website Metamorphose, which is an interdisciplinary exploration of the personal and cultural dimensions of transformation. I couldn't think of a better person to come and illustrate the power of interdisciplinary on, as I say, one of the grandest challenges facing the 21st century than Simran, and I'm really looking forward to your talk. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Guy, for that lovely introduction. Um, and thank you, Caroline Boata Teves, as well as to Luke Goter for all your assistance in getting me here today. Um, I'm so grateful for everyone turning up, <laughs> first and foremost, um, and, and really for this, for this invitation in particular to um, join you during Interdisciplinary Study Week. Uh, as Guy referenced, I actually do feel very strongly that the only way to solve our most pressing global problems is through interdisciplinary engagement. And uh, I'm really thrilled that the University of Southampton has uh, chosen to engage in this in a, in a very authentic way. I've heard a lot about this in a lot of different academic institutions, but it's really nice to see it in action. And uh, my exploration of endangered foods, the loss of agricultural biodiversity, and the slow extinction of what we grow and eat is born out of that same real realization that we will only solve these problems when we come together. I um, come to you today just days off of my recent trip to Ethiopia. If you look closely at my arms, you'll see lots of flea bites here. I, uh, they're all healing. I'm not contagious or scary in any way, but it looks a little dramatic. Um, and I was there doing research for um, my book. I'm writing a book on the loss of agrobiodiversity, and I was looking specifically at coffee and at conservation efforts at coffee uh, in the wild. So looking at coffee forests, looking at the, the um, the ways in which the, the human, humanity interfaces with the environment. 
and, and that sort of um, critical place where those things come together and that interdependence that, ne that is needed to continue to support both uh, the ecosystem and the community that, that thrives and survives off the ecosystem. Our most intimate uh, engagement with the environment other than communing directly in nature is through food. And uh, this image is from an exhibition last summer at Kew Royal Botanical Gardens, which was on food and biodiversity. Did anyone here have a chance to see that exhibition? Brilliant. So yeah, it was so lovely. They had this huge picnic table and they had all the food growing out of the plates and it really just brought home the fact that um, where exactly where the food comes from. And, uh, and I think that's critical because people don't have relationships to reusable shopping bags or to light bulbs. I know because I've traversed the terrain of these issues. As a guy mentioned, I've been on the Oprah Winfrey show several times. I've been on all kinds of chat shows talking about how to save the planet. Um, what people particularly want to know is 10 easy ways to save the planet. That's their favorite way, um, is the easy ways. And uh, initially, I'll tell you, I was very thrilled. You know, the first time you're asked to be on the Oprah Winfrey show, I mean, I should say not you, but I certainly said, like, we'd like some tips. I said, sure, whatever you want, I can give you, I can give you. And it was, uh, it was a program where Al Gore and Leonardo DiCaprio and I were all on the program. A year later, they invited me back. I said, yeah, you know, tell us, do you have some more tips? Okay. Well, Al Gore told you those tips in year one, so I guess I can repeat them in year two. The third time they asked me back, I remember standing beside Ms. Winfrey and thinking to myself, I'm doing something really wrong if I'm on this show that has this kind of viewership for the third time, and I'm not alone. You know, there are heaps of people who are far more interesting and famous talking about all these issues, and I'm telling you about light bulbs. I'm still talking to you about the same thing that I was telling you about before. And before I told you, Al Gore told you, Leonardo DiCaprio told you, fill in the blank told you about this. So, so what's the problem? Um, and uh, I'll explain this a little bit more later, but what I came to was a conclusion that the relationships that we have are to food. Um, it's not to the electric grid, uh, and everything that we need to do has to tie back to the relationships that are most intimate to us. It's not to say that we can't make that same connection with the electricity, it's critical for how we move through our day, but for me, the straightest, um, the most direct way to get there, and the one that was already closest to my heart, was through food. Uh, the relationships that we have with food, of cultivating, of harvesting, of ingesting, of relying so heavily on the land and on others for our daily sustenance, to me, nothing matches this in terms of intimacy. Food is our deepest interface with the land, and it reflects our interdependence with each other and with our environment. But uh, this relationship, as I mentioned at the beginning, is in crisis. The Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, where I spent four months last summer, estimates that 75% of um, crop varieties have disappeared since 1900. And the shrinkage of genetic variants echoes through every link in our food chain and strips inputs, crops, livestock, and aquatic life of their ability to adapt to changes in the environment. That thereby puts our entire food supply at risk. This extinction of food that I am referring to is a process. It's one that's buried in the soil, it's hidden within feedlots, and it's immersed in the sea. And it doesn't seem obvious when we're walking through aisles at Tesco or even I was looking at some of the small food shops today um, on the main street here. Um, and I saw such a, a seemingly a variety of fruits and vegetables, you know, at the international market and all these places. And, um, but the truth is we're actually growing fewer varieties of foods. And we are at the same time reducing the diversity in the soil and in our pollination services, in the bees, birds, insects that pollinate our crops and slowly, 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 insidiously, insidiously, excuse me, we are inserting vulnerability into our food system. Scientists call this loss genetic erosion, and it's accompanied by a cultural erosion that I don't think gets discussed enough. And that is the loss of indigenous methods of cultivating, harvesting, and preparing diverse foods and drinks. So if you're new to the information that I'm going to present today, then I hope you'll come away with an understanding of what's <coughs> at stake. 
And if you already work in this area, I hope that my background as a journalist will help inform how we can better frame the conversation and garner more interest. I studied sociology and women's studies uh, in my undergraduate degrees, and then I went on to get a business degree focused on sustainability. I was a working journalist who then moved into academia and then who moved back into journalism when I found that I needed to be closer to the stories that I was going to tell. Uh, and I'd like to start off with a bit of a broader overview that uh, impacts food and everything it is that we care about. And that is the umbrella under which all environmental issues fall, climate change. This is an interactive flood map of the UK. Uh, we can't draw a direct line between floods and climate change, though some are trying to. But what we can say is that heavy rainfall and coastal inundation is consistent with the physics of a warming world. During the last century, sea level, in, uh, sea level rise in the English Channel has increased by around 12 centimeters and is continuing to rise at a rate of 1.3 centimeters per decade. And this is because land-based snow and ice is melting into the sea and because seawater expands as it warms. So higher seas mean a greater chance of storm surges and uh, breaching of, of coastal defenses. In addition to that, warmer air can hold more moisture. So in a warmer world, a given storm has the capacity to hold more rain. And uh, therefore, we can expect heavier storms and when they do come, and that climate models in the UK suggest that uh, on average, the country will get warmer and wetter winters from here on out. But uh, as anyone who does climate modeling in the room can tell you, uh, these models can only go so far. That's because psychologists have almost no evidence that data changes people's decision making. We tend to exhibit confirmation bias, embracing facts that affirm our worldview and disregarding facts that don't. And it's fascinating to see this change now in real time. The evolution as we see the planet warming, as we physically experience it, the evolution and, and people's shifting beliefs around climate change. I remember, um, I guess five or six years ago, when I first really started to um, beat a heavier drum around climate change issues, I was not alone, again, in doing this, um, but there was a really strong upsurge in the United States around people who were supporting it. You know, Al Gore's film and Inconvenient Truth had come out. There was a lot of talk around climate change. And then we saw a kind of a political backlash around that where people were incredibly frustrated. And at first I couldn't understand why. And slowly I realized we were asking people to, um, to bring into the forefront of their cares an invisible gas that was going to affect them decades from now. And we wanted them to care about it right now. And that was a really hard sell for people. In addition to that, we were talking about uh, a journalistic environment where uh, a lot of people were trying to sort of weigh the pros and cons of the situation and create debate where there was no debate to be had. Right? So, um, so the reason I want to talk about facts for a moment is because I think it really upends a paradigm that most scientists and academics operate under. Uh, and I would add journalists to that category and I would put myself in maybe a few of those categories. Um, that if we just present more evidence, more data, more facts, that people will come around. Um, and often underneath that idea is the belief that those who don't respond to the data are completely daft or they just don't care. But the reason climate change, the loss of biodiversity, food waste, and myriad other issues haven't gotten traction isn't because people don't resonate with the issue. It's because they don't resonate with the story. Um, <laughs> and I'll tell you quickly a, a short story. First, I'll, I'll just briefly mention the way I started to come to this inquiry and start to tease this out was in that moment with Oprah Winfrey, where I was holding another light bulb in my hand. And then at some point, I think we talked about insulation, you know, for, the, for walls and stuffing it into window corners. And I just thought, uh, what's going on here? Why, why are we repeating ourselves over and over again? And, um, and that's when I started to look into the psychology behind this. And I realized the same thing uh, last summer when, as I mentioned, I was in Rome at the Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN. Now, FAO, FAO, has an incredibly important mandate, and that is to um, alleviate hunger, alleviate global hunger. I can think of nothing more noble than this. 
Um, and Caroline can sympathize with me here. That's where we actually met was at FAO. Uh, the way people talk about food at FAO is um, they refer to plant genetic resources for food and agriculture, right? So plant genetic resources for food and agriculture are what maybe most of us would call seeds and crops and food. Um, but in that parlance, we call it PGRFA. And I think that starts to kind of touch upon the reasons why no one knows A, what the hell we're talking about, and B, doesn't care, right? The abstraction of this gets really hard for people. Um, and, and I was disconnected from the information as well. I, um, I remember I met with uh, people from the Global Crop Diversity Trust, which is the, um, an entity affiliated with FAO that's tasked with overseeing the seed bank, the, what is called the Doomsday Vault in Svalbard. Uh, between Norway and the Arctic Circle. And I was describing to a senior scientist there, ah, you know, I'm working on this book. At the time, the book was focused strictly on seeds. Um, I'm working on this book on, uh, you know, this is me and technology, um, on the loss of biodiversity and, blah, blah. And uh, my editor doesn't feel like it's, you know, seeds are sexy enough. And uh, this scientist leaned in. And at, until this point, he'd been really, really bored with me. You know, he's like, who is this woman who doesn't understand PGRFA? He's picking his teeth with my business card. You know, <laughs> I'm feeling really sheepish. And he says, Simran, seeds are sex. And in that moment, I realized even in my own work, I had completely lost sight of sort of what it was that we were doing. And it was also a really funny, sexy moment. Um, <laughs> seeds are sex. Right, and, and we, so we both have work to do. The journalist, me, had work to do, and the scientist, Luigi, had work to do in telling the story. And that's why this engagement across disciplines is so critical. I couldn't tell the story without him, and he couldn't, well, he could. <laughs> I'm sure he could, but somebody else couldn't tell the story without me, right? Okay, and that brings me to this, the green brain. In 1927, Swedish ethnologist Carl Wilhelm von Sydow proposed the concept of oikotype. It's a term borrowed from botany, and it refers to a local or regional form of a plant. What von Sydow argued um, is that stories adapt to different locations in the same way that plants adapt to different climates and soils. So my stories and my understanding of sustainability was transformed when I moved from New York City in the United States to Lawrence, Kansas, which is right in the middle of the country. Um, the equivalent might be moving from London to Norwich, which, uh, as Guy mentioned, I'll be, I'll be there. Or actually, maybe you mentioned that earlier today. I'll be there um, later this week. Much of how we engage and experience our world happens in what I call our green brain. Uh, and that is that our biology is, to some extent, our biography. And it's our psychology that shapes our stories and informs how we engage in and with the world. And that's how interdisciplinary work functions. And new research indicates that this engagement not only informs our worldview, but actually changes our molecular structure. A few years ago, honeybee researcher Gene Robinson and his associates at Mexico's National Center for Research in Animal, uh, in animal Physiology placed newborn European honeybees into the hives of African killer bees. Dr. Robinson expected that the bees would be changed by their adoptive homes, right? That actually didn't come as any surprise, that the killer bees would become more docile when they were surrounded by European bees. And that the European bees that were entered into the hive, and they were entered during a time when this, the hive would actually accept them, that the European bees would develop some of the African bees' killer instincts. He expected the bees' genes would behave differently in the new homes. And that is what's known as variable gene expression. In any given cell, at any given time, only a tiny percentage of genes are active. And they're sending out chemical messages that affect the activity of the cell. It's triggered by both biological and environmental responses. And the general thinking is that, the, is that our environment incites or quells the activity of only a few genes at a time. But what Robinson proposed, as described by author David Dobbs, um, was that the environment could transform big sectors of genes right across the genome. 
and that an individual's social environment might exert a substantive effect. So essentially what Robinson suggested was that we're impacted by the company we keep. Who we spend time with and how they behave could dramatically affect which of our genes speak up and which of our genes stay quiet. The move between hives didn't just make the bees act differently. It made the bees' genes work differently on a broad scale. And as they moved through their little bee lives, their genes acted more and more like their hive mates. The genome, without changing its code, seemed to transform these animals into something like a very different subspecies. So they didn't just act differently, and this is what I think is critical. For all intents and purposes, they became different. Now, around the same time Dr. Robinson was having his bee revelation, psychologist Steve Cole started to introduce whole genome, uh, gene, whole genome gene expression to social psychology. So we think of our bodies, I certainly thought of my body, as a stable biological structure that moves around in the world. Um, but that we're fundamentally separate from it. You know, I'm, I mean, you know, my background was in sociology. I understood that I would have some relationship with my environment and be shaped by it. But, you know, again, that there would be limits to this. So um, in that same article from David Dobbs, what, uh, what uh, Dr. Robinson says is that we're learning from our molecular processes that actually keep our bodies running is that we are far more fluid than we realize. The world, he said, and I think this is so beautiful, passes through us. Um, that's one of the best articles I have to say I've ever read on this subject, which is why I wanted to quote it to you directly. Uh, doctors, Dr. Cole's study on gene expression um, in children with asthma was published in the peer-reviewed journal Thorax, which is a, a journal focused on respiratory medicine. And he and two other researchers ran gene expression profiles on 31 children with asthma. 10 were from lower income families and 15 were from higher income families. And as Cole expected, the wealthier children uh, were healthier. The poorer children showed more active inflammatory genes and had more asthma attacks and other health related problems. So it seemed on the surface that poverty was reducing their immunity. But this is where it gets interesting. In addition to collecting medical data and drawing blood, um, the, the researchers showed children films of uncomfortable social situations. Social situations, maybe like standing in front of a group of strangers giving a speech <laughs> or, um, or something less comfortable. Um, and most of the children from low income backgrounds tended to perceive the films to be more threatening than the rich ones. But a few children went against that type in either direction. And so when the researchers overlaid this information onto their gene expression scores, what they found was that really the children's understandings of the film, and by extension their understanding and beliefs about the world, not their income levels, accounted for most of the differences in gene expression. The primary driver, and this is a small study, but I think just fascinating, the primary driver of their suppressed immunity wasn't the material conditions of their lives. It was how they perceived their lives to be. All right, so what does this have to do with this? With agricultural biodiversity and food? And with the urgency to feed ourselves and sustain a safe, just, equitable food supply for everyone today and for future generations? I believe everything. Because at the heart of this inquiry is the fact that we are changed by our environment and that our perceptions matter and that the stories that we tell about ourselves and about each other matter. These stories, the essence of who we are and how we see the world, are shaped by factors that we're only just now beginning to understand. And what we see and more importantly, what we directly experience matters. It's not that we don't care about drought or famine or climate change. It's that we simply cannot fathom their magnitude. Behavioral economists uh, Patricia Linville and Gregory Fisher place their concerns in what they call the finite pool of worry. If you leave this presentation with nothing else, I hope you'll hold on to this. 
because I think um, it can help transform how we engage with each other and how we talk about not only the research that we do, but the subjects, the people that we're talking about. Um, so this notion of finite pool of worry basically asserts that there's only so much we can concern ourselves with at one time. So we can't ask people to worry about something new, especially not something far away in time or space, unless we can displace concerns that are in their pool of worry. What is in everyone's pool of worry? Saving our hunger. <laughs> um, so according to FAO, as I mentioned before, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, since the 1900s, 75% of crop varieties have disappeared. This is, is exemplified by the graphic behind me. I know some of these, uh, these images, these numbers are really small, so I'll read a couple of them out to you. But I wanted you to see this bigger snapshot, right? It's um, the kinds of varieties of seeds that were offered in the United States in the <coughs> early 1900s compared to what was offered 80 years later toward the end of last century. Now, according to Toby Musgrave, a horticulturist and garden historian here in Europe, Europe has lost about 2,000 cultivars since the 1970s alone. And in America, the Center for Biodiversity and Conservation estimates that 96% of commercial vegetable cultivars available in 1903 are now extinct. So what you can't see, the little numbers in the graphic are what I'm gonna share with you now. 408 varieties of peas, down to 25. 307 varieties of sweet maize, down to 12. 544 cabbages, down to 28, and so on. The consolidation and commercialization of seeds has increased at the same time that biodiversity has decreased. Uh, and this has grown exponentially, as you can see from the date at the top, in the last few decades. This graphic is from the Cornucopia Institute in the United States. In 1995, and the reason I'm of course using the United States as an example is not only because I come from there, but because this is one of the most acute examples in the world of the loss of agricultural biodiversity. The way I actually came into this research was through an investigation of genetically modified organisms, genetically engineered seeds and food uh, for research that I was doing in Rome. And when I went and met these scientists from FAO, from Bioversity International, they said, Simran, this is a really big issue in your country. But on a global scale, scale, what we're concerned about is this genetic erosion, this slower loss, this insidious loss that no one's talking about. And over the course of weeks, I shifted my, the focus of my book and my research to, to this subject uh, after hearing from these people and meeting from them. Um, okay, so to return to the United States, in the 1995, the top 10 commercial seed companies owned 37% of commercial seeds. Now, commercial seeds include hybrid seeds and genetically engineered transgenic seeds, um, seeds that are commonly known as GMOs. Today, these companies own 73% of the market. And one company, Monsanto, owns 27% of the market of all commercialized seeds. This includes um, Seminus, which is the world's largest developer, grower, and maker of vegetable seeds. And they were acquired by Monsanto back in 2005. So again, while the focus for a lot of people, even looking at a company like Monsanto, has been on genetically engineered seeds, what we are talking about here is the corporatization of all seeds. Uh, and GE, genetically engineered seeds, are just one part of this. In developed countries, this consolidation has transformed not only seeds, but land use. Uh, we are now using our precious agricultural land and inputs, ranging from water and fertilizers to the input of human effort to grow not only food, but biofuel, such as corn, ethanol, and animal feed. <clears throat> the United States is the top grower of GMO crops. Our top crops are corn, soy, cotton, and uh, corn, soy, and cotton, and roughly 90% of them are genetically engineered. Most of these are Roundup Ready soy and corn, and they're engineered for herbicide resistance. We also uh, grow a lot of BT cotton, which is engineered for insect resistance. Um, and of course, these crops, or these seeds, I should say, are owned by the company with most of the market share, and that is Monsanto. The corn and soy 
uh, that's used in most processed American foods is why 70% uh, of processed foods in the United States are believed to contain genetically engineered food. Now, this kind of monopoly, I think, is challenging enough with something like a mobile phone, but it's disastrous with food because it not only reduces biodiversity, it impedes competition, it increases risk, and it makes us more vulnerable. How? How does it do this? Um, okay, so the number one crop grown in the United States is maize. Nearly 90% 90, 90 of it is genetically engineered for herbicide tolerance. And now that crop is facing a bacterial wilt that has cut some farmers' yields in half. Allison Robertson is a plant pathologist at Iowa State University in the, med in, in the Midwest in the United States. And what she has estimated is that about 10% of this year's corn crop will fall to Goss's wilt, to this, uh, to this bacterial wilt. Now, this is not an indictment of genetic engineering. I want to be clear. People have many thoughts around this topic. But what I want to say here is um, we have built this vulnerability into this system. Um, her research, uh, Allison Robertson's research, is funded by Monsanto. And it's also funded by the United States Department of Agriculture. And she, along with other plant pathologists, suspect, according to a recent report published in the New York Times, and I quote her here, the hybrids chosen for genetic modification because of their yield potential were also the ones that were highly susceptible to Goss's wilt. So this is the predicament that we find ourselves in, in modern agriculture. And it is largely because of monocropping and plant selection. And of course, this is not limited to corn. I just wanted to use that as the example because it is so stark and because it is happening in real time. And the people who will suffer uh, will be the shareholders of Monsanto's stock. But more importantly, will be the farmers who grow this corn. And it will be the people who will now have to pay the price premium for these losses. Um, and this is not limited to corn, and this is not a contemporary phenomenon. This is the partial cause, as you are acutely aware of here, of the Irish potato famine, uh, the partial cause. Um, this is also the reason for the coffee leaf rust we're seeing in Central America, uh, the soil fungus that threatens the global banana crop. Most of which, by the way, if you're not familiar with the banana story, um, I'm steeped in this information all the time now, um, most of the banana crop is the Cavendish cultivar that was planted when a different strain of the same fungus wiped out an earlier banana that we used to eat in the 1950s called the Gros Michel. And in the 1980s, right, dependence upon a single uh, type of grapevine root forced California grape growers to replace approximately 2 million acres of vine when a new race of the pest insect Phylloxera right, attacked uh, their vines. Phylloxera, of course, is the same virus that caused France to adopt American rootstock uh, last century because the same fungus had attacked those roots. So we can see history repeating itself here, but for some reason, we're not learning the lessons yet. The reduction in genetic variance starts with the seed, but it echoes through, as I'd mentioned earlier, every link in our food chain. And it strips inputs, crops, livestock, and aquatic life of their ability to adapt to changes in the environment. Now, what I've taken liberty to do here, because I really wanted you to be able to read all of it, is to break up a graphic from FAO, with their permission, um, to help you see clearly what's at stake. Of the 80,000 plant varieties, plant species that are edible, we now only cultivate about 150. And of that, 95% of the world's calories now come from about 30 species. The extinction of food is a process. It's in our cup of coffee, it's in our milk, it's in our morning toast, it's in our beer, it's in our wine. 75% of the world's food is generated from only 12 plant and five animal species. 30% of livestock breeds are at risk of extinction, and six breeds are lost every month. Are there any agronomists in the room? All right, then I guess I'm the expert in this. <laughs> 
Um, well, what they'll remind you, if they were here, what they would remind you of is that this is what we do in agriculture, right? I remember actually Snow Barlow, who's um, a professor of horticulture and viticulture. I just spent four months um, in Australia at the University of Melbourne. He said to me, Simran, agriculture is always moving toward this point. Like we're always refining, we're always selecting. This is what we do, you know? This isn't anything new, right? We select for specific traits and then we slowly eliminate the rest. I mean, think of Darwin, you know? Um, but the problem is the pyramid is getting awfully pointy. And now that we've, now we've taken it to the extreme. So what could be fit isn't being allowed to flourish. And generally speaking, our industrialized food system favors high yields to the exclusion of everything else. Okay, now this makes a lot of sense on a scale like this, right? For economies of scale to grow single varieties of foods in monocultures. You can apply the same amount of water, you can apply uniform amounts and kinds of pesticides and fertilizers, and you can harvest everything at the same time, right? This kind of large scale agriculture is what we call an industrialized model. And it's the model that is often contrasted with diversified agri-systems, uh, small agri-systems that are often called peasant farms. I was mentioning this earlier this morning in the meeting that we had, um, Frank Roy, who's the former assistant president of IFAD, um, which is the International Fund for Agricultural Development, told me last summer when I was in Rome um, that this type of farming, right, that was ushered in during the Green Revolution was what people wanted. Right? The hope and the belief was that this would feed the world. And um, people felt so proud, he said, of these clean fields full of one crop, not the messy fields growing a variety of crops together. Increased industrialization in any field leads to a demand for efficiencies and economies of scale. Now, what this means in terms of food and agriculture is a standardization of growing and harvesting practices, breeding plants that are uniform in size and shape, increasing mechanization, increasing the size of the farm, and homogenizing our crops, right? The monocropping of uniform varieties and reduced crop rotation. This is what modern agriculture looks like. This is the model that was heralded throughout the Green Revolution and until very recently has been the model that we are moving the world toward. But what this also results in, perhaps unintentionally, is the erosion of traditional knowledge and agricultural traditions. The value of growing things locally has been trumped by the value of uniformity. Did I do that or is it just... <laughs> Did I do that? Oh, okay. <laughs> Thanks, Luke. <gasps> yeah. Um, so, so this local knowledge and these breeding techniques that are invisible here are eroding alongside of this genetic erosion, right? And the standard response to this is what? We have to feed people. We have to have cheap food. And my question to that statement is, at what cost? What is it that we give up in this system? Are we healthier? Are our communities thriving? Are our ecosystems more resilient? And have we responded to people's concerns in their finite pool of worry? Are we feeding people in this model? People in the UK uh, spend approximately 9% of their income on food. UK households waste 6.7 million tons of food every year, and, uh, uh, which is around one third of the 21.7 million tons of food purchased. Is that me? Is it someone's cell phone? Someone's cell phone. I know, who's got their phone on and is buzzing? Anyone want to turn it off? Okay. Um, these numbers are really important. In the United Kingdom, 64% of adults are classified as being overweight or obese, according to a 2014 report, uh, while, or earlier this year, I guess, while more than half a million people were forced to use food banks last year. Okay? Um, the reasons that people are hungry 
is because of a lack of access to food, to having the money to buy food, to having the knowledge to cook food, not because of availability. We have an abundance of cheap food now, right? Monocultures in the name of feeding people don't make sense because we're feeding ourselves in ways that are making us less healthy. 925 million people in the world are suffering from hunger while, and this is a, a FAO stat, while 1.5 billion people are now considered overweight or obese. However, as Guy referenced at the beginning, in both of these groups, people are suffering from micronutrient malnutrition, and that includes vitamin A, iron, and iodine deficiency. Worldwide obesity has nearly doubled since 1980. Every person in here has been in our lifetimes, this, almost everyone, this has doubled. Okay, um, so in the name of feeding people, what are we feeding ourselves? And what are the impacts of what it is that we're feeding ourselves with? As above, to get back to this genetic erosion, so below. 10 species of fish account for 30% of hunted wild fish and 50% of farmed, farmed fish. Wild aquatic life uh, might be harder to come by as well, according to a new report from the International Program on the State of the Ocean. Uh, it reads, the deadly trio of acidification because of increased carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, warming of the oceans, and deoxygenation due to algal blooms is seriously affecting how productive and efficient the ocean is. Tomorrow, I'll be taking a look at microorganisms and invertebrates. These are the even less visible losses that we are suffering. The yeasts, the bacterias, and the pollinators. Right. This is what a world without bees looks like. Um, the increased use, as probably everyone in this room has heard, but just in case you missed it, the increased use of a class of insecticides known as neonicotinoids are suspected to be a contributing factor of bee colony collapse disorder, which is why three neonicotinoid-based pesticides were recently banned here in the United Kingdom. Some farmers and beekeepers have expressed concern that this might facilitate a return to older, more toxic pesticides. Um, so it's critical that we look very deeply at this issue because pollination services are vital. And this is what I was talking about earlier about also making, um, making information a bit more accessible to people. Uh, when I went to FAO, we talked a lot about ecosystem services and pollination services. But what people really understand is bees and food, right? People don't even really understand bees until you get to food. And I thought that Whole Food Grocery did a brilliant campaign in this regard. They did a campaign showing the importance of pollination by taking pollinated items out of their stores. They pulled 237 of 453 produce items. So staples like apples, broccoli, and carrots were completely gone in the post honeybee store. I couldn't find any more updated statistics, even though I've tried very hard and I know that people are working on this right now. But according to a study in uh, ecological economics, the total economic value of pollination <laughs> services worldwide amounted to 153 billion uh, euro in 2005, which represented nearly 10% of the value of world agricultural production used for human food in that year. So the loss of bees is the loss of food and the loss of substantial amounts of money. 10% of our food production is the result of free pollination efforts of bees, right? So the term worker bee is actually really quite literal. Um, and they're disappearing right now, and we're not exactly sure why. So by losing agrobiodiversity, I mean losing food security. And by losing food security, I mean putting our food supply at risk. The pollinator that I am most partial to is something called a midge. Because midges, these tiny little gnat-like creatures, the kind of thing that you want to just like swat away, <laughs> unless it's pollinating this plant, pollinate 95% of this. Um, can anyone tell me what this is? I, a year ago, I couldn't tell you. Six months ago, I don't think I could tell you what this was. It's cacao. It's the beginning of chocolate. 
Uh, chocolate wasn't really a big part of my book um, that I mentioned earlier that I'm writing on the loss of agrobiodiversity until I took my own advice and started to consider what psychologists are talking about, about the finite pool of worry, right? Okay, so I mentioned last summer I spent four months in Italy, and I didn't just sit at FAO and at Bioversity International. I also had uh, went out with friends, had many drinks, had lots of pasta, lots of pizza, and then I went back to the United States, a few kilos heavier, and I thought, all right, it's time to cleanse, you know, restart. Um, and you know, at that point, I'll tell you, after sitting at FAO for so long, I was assured that I was writing a book about the loss of our staple crops, you know, sorghum, finger millet, maize, rice, potatoes. That was my book. And maybe all of you would have bought it. <laughs> but I don't know. I don't know if anyone else would have. Um, okay, so those 30%, you know, those 30 crops that account for 95% of our food, you know, the energy in our food dominated by these staples I just mentioned, that's what I was going to focus on, right? And then I was just going to sprinkle on top a little chocolate, you know, throw on a little wine, you know, just a little bit of coffee on the side. Um, this was that evolution from that original book, which was on seeds, you know, the sexy seeds. Um, and the epiphany for me was when I was there uh, in California, started the cleanse, met up with a botanist turned chocolatier for my marginal chapter, you know, just gonna meet him for half an hour, see the chocolate operation, in and out. I'm on a cleanse, I don't need to be surrounded by chocolate. Okay, two and a half hours later, we're in the middle of this conversation still, but it started off with this man, Brad Kinzer, running late. And he said, Simmer and I need a few minutes, and this chocolate place is called Cho. Um, it's a play on chocolate, the first cho uh, syllable of chocolate, and it's in San Francisco, right on the water. And he said, you know, they have a, before we ate chocolate, actually, we used to drink chocolate. So they have a chocolate drinking, a, a drinking chocolate cafe. Help yourself to whatever you want, Summer, and I'll be right back. You know, I need a few minutes. It's like, thanks, Brad. I go up to the cafe and I was like, can I have some water, please? You know, because I'm on this cleanse. So I'm so virtuous on the cleanse. And then, um, then I should go ahead and move you over to Cho. This is Cho. And then Brad and I start talking. We move into the conference room. They're testing out a new chocolate bar, a nochole bar with hazelnuts in it. There's just bars of broken chocolate all over the table. Help yourself, Summer, and have anything you want. Oh, I'm, so, I'm just here with my water. I'm just so good with my water, Brad. Um, okay, so, you know, there I was. Then we chat, chat, chat. Now he's taking me to the factory. We move toward the inner sanctum of the factory where things are warm, where they melt the cacao solids back into a liquid form. And the reason they do this is they import all the chocolate into the United States in that solid form. If they imported the bean and there was any evidence of bug or mold or whatever, they, the United States, the USDA fumigates the entire shipment, right? But this is organic cacao, so it really would mess things up. So they import it already. They do all the roasting and all the um, liquoring is what they call it to make it into the cake in the countries in which they work. The machine is warming the chocolate. It's a stainless steel drum and the smell of chocolate is overwhelming. And all of a sudden, I'm like weak in the knees and touching the machine, you know, like it's a deity. And Brad is like so shocked, he takes a picture. And I realize at that moment, this is what I don't want to lose. I can actually do without corn. I don't know about all of you, but I could be okay without rice. I'm Indian, but I could still do be okay without rice. But chocolate, I don't want to lose this. And, um, and it was, it was epiphanic because this is when I realized this is in my, this is, ha chocolate has been every single one of my birthday cakes. Chocolate was my wedding cake. Chocolate got me through my divorce. <laughs> chocolate means something to me. I don't know how you wake up in the morning, but I'm going to guess it's tea or coffee. And what if I told you these things are on the verge of, we're losing them. We are losing these things. So maybe you don't care about the finger millet or the sorghum. But what if, what if I told you in seven years we're going to suffer a huge loss in coffee? You know, I mean, like these are the kinds of things that I think like people really do resonate with and connect to. So I started to take my own advice and think about what was in my finite pool of worry. And I asked myself, what can I do to make this tangible? And of course, um, I'm not alone. Uh, Europeans, <laughs> when it comes to chocolate, certainly Europeans account for nearly half of all the chocolate the world eats. According to the International uh, Cocoa Organization, the average 
Brit, Swiss, or German will eat around 11 kilograms of chocolate in a year. And the demand for cocoa products has never been higher. According to the ICA, ICO, which is the International Cocoa Organization, the current annual value of the cocoa market is roughly four to six billion pounds. And rising economies, including India and China, are going to require an increase in chocolate of 25% in the next seven years to meet the demand. Now, 90, 90% of the global supply of cacao comes from about 6 million smallholder farmers across Africa, Asia, and Latin America. And when I say smallholder farmers, I am talking about farmers farming tiny plots of land, not those big monocultures that you saw earlier, right? The average chocolate comes from a plot, I don't know, around the size of this room, or perhaps a little bit bigger than this room. The nibs that become the chocolate that we know and love start off as these giant pods. They're like, uh, you know, these yellow, big football kind of things, right, growing out of the side of the tree. And um, they're hacked off with machetes. And most of the farmers that are involved in this process have never actually tasted the final product. I spoke with uh, Phyllis Johnson just to switch gears for a moment. Phyllis Johnson, who works with the um, with an organization that focuses on women in coffee. And she's describing to me um, women farmers in Rwanda picking coffee. I don't know if any of you have seen a cof what coffee looks like when it's on a tree. I hadn't, again, until I started doing this research. It looks like cranberries. It looks like little red berries, holly berries, I don't know, you know, small cherries. They're called cherries on the tree. They're red or they're yellow. And the only country in Africa with the tradition of drinking coffee is the birthplace of coffee, and that is Ethiopia. All these other countries that maybe provide your, the coffee that you drink in a day, Rwanda, Burundi, Kenya, for all these other countries, it's a cash crop. And Philip asked, uh, Phyllis excuse me, asked one of these women in Rwanda, do you know what you're picking? And she said, I don't know, bullets? Like she didn't know what this was. She had absolutely no comprehension of this, except that it was something that would help her put food on the table. It's not dissimilar with chocolate. Um, Cho, the company that I was mentioning earlier, is one organization within cacao, within chocolate, that's striving to change that. And they have set up flavor innovation labs in each of their production territories so farmers can start to select and grow cacao with taste in mind. Currently, the quality control in chocolate is aimed toward visual characteristics. Are the beans moldy? Do they have bugs? Are they broken? Are they underripe or overripe? And secondarily, looking at what we call post-harvest activities of drying and fermentation. Now, all these qualities have everything to do with yield, but nothing to do with taste, right? Yield is important, especially if we need to feed all those chocoholics in India and China, but Taste is also important. And one of the main drivers for the loss of agrobiodiversity in chocolate, but across the board in food, is this question, this tension between taste and yield. Taste, I believe, is the way that we can combat and return from this loss. This slide is, again, borrowed from FAO. It's a snapshot of the drivers of the loss of agrobiodiversity in food. It is incomplete, however. Um, I'm actually working with the scientist who picked his teeth with my business card, and a couple other people to try to create a more comprehensive uh, list. About 7,000 species of plants have been cultivated for consumption in human history. Um, and the diversity of varieties of foods is because of that dynamic relationship between us and our environment, right? Guaranteeing food for our survival and for the development of our population. But also understanding that that helps sustain areas when managed properly. Um, now as we're increasingly dependent on a relatively small number of crops for our global food security, um, the need for high genetic diversity within these crops is critical. Because what we've done is sh shrunken this in two ways. We've shrunken the amount of foods that we're eating, the kinds of varieties of foods we're eating. And then within that, we've also made each one of these little points very pointy, right? Coffee is another is a, is a great example of this. There are two varieties of coffee that we rely on in the world to drink. Two. 
One is Arabica and one is Robusta. Robusta is the coffee that you find in like cheap instant coffee. Arabica is probably anyone who's going to a cafe and having a coffee or maybe buying beans from a, a nice roaster. Those are all Arabica. There's one place in the world that holds 99.9% .9 of the genetic diversity for that one crop and that forest where all the genetic diversity is held has been deforested at a rate of around 11% per year for every year until the last five years where there's now been a concerted effort to come back from that. Again, that forest is in Ethiopia where I just had a, was there, I just feasted on my bugs. Um, in commercial cacao, right? Um, what we see is when these crops suffer, the challenges are really bad, right? So right now, just to go back to coffee for a minute, two varieties, one is Arabica, um, all that Arabica is susceptible to something called coffee leaf rust. Just as all the cacao is susceptible to, um, well, a number of different things, but um, the one that you're seeing here is frosty pod rot. So what happens is, because we're only growing one variety, is when these sorts of things happen, they wipe out everything. It's the, the wilt that we're seeing, the gosses wilt we're seeing in corn in the United States. It's the coffee leaf rust we're seeing throughout coffee in Central America. And it's the frosty pod wilt that we're seeing in, throughout Africa in all the cacao that's grown there. Um, these infestations infect pods within the first three months of development. And because 90% of the world's cacao is grown in developing countries, um, most of these farmers are relying on this not just to eat chocolate, Right? They never get the chocolate, but to feed their families and to sustain themselves. Um, they only get about 4% of the money generated by a bar of chocolate that's sold. Um, and in addition to that, they're paid by, not by the day, the way we are, or by the term or by the year. They're paid by the harvest. So you lose the harvest and you lose your ability to feed yourself. The, the need for the forest whether it's in coffee or cacao, is to dip back into that genetic reserve, right? To find the varieties that have different kinds of form of resistance that might still be available. We may, may not be growing them commercially, but they're available in the wild. And if we can access those again, we can start to bring them back into this food supply. We can create hybrids. We can do what we can to ensure that these crops will sustain. Right? If we don't have the wild Amazonian cocoa varieties because we've deforested the Amazon or we've wiped out the kaffa forest where the coffee, the wild coffee is grown, then we don't have the resources to fight these diseases. And these are the forests that we're cutting down and we're replacing them with more lucrative crops. In the case of uh, coffee, we're replacing it in Africa, in Ethiopia with something called chat. Uh, coffee, which you may know, is harvested once a year. Um, chat is harvested every few weeks and the price differential for those crops is exponentially different. So the question of what people will grow is really about will or will they not be able to feed themselves. Um, the, the Svalbard bank I mentioned earlier in Norway is the one where we have a huge seed repository that is known as ex situ seed conservation and it's where we hold the seeds or the germplasm, the plant material, out of place. And we say to ourselves, we've got our backup, right? We're gonna be okay. But what we also must consider is responses that are a bit more dynamic, conservation responses that are a bit more dynamic. Um, the International Cocoa Gene Bank in Trinidad is the largest and most genetically uh, diverse collection of cocoa germplasm that's in the public domain. But the reason we can't just rely on that is because they're in the process of losing their funding. So every time they lose their funding, they lose the ability to sustain some of these diverse varieties of cocoa, of cacao. In addition to that, what we find with these seed banks that are ex situ, out of place, is the, the seeds are freeze dried, right? And they're put in the vault and they're saved. But what they're not doing is responding to climate change and cultural change. When we put those seeds far away, we're losing the indigenous traditions of how to grow the foods and how to eat the foods and prepare the foods. It's not just about the plant material. It's about the entire cultural ecosystem that sustains that plant and that food. So what we need to do 
is work in two ways. And I'll, I'll wrap this up. I realize I'm going on very, very long. Um, is to work within the confines of the knowledge that we have and the technical, technical know-how we have. This is actually a mapping of the cacao genome, which I think is really interesting. So, so scientists are hard at work trying to find ways to combat the losses that we're seeing in chocolate. Um, what we also have the opportunity to do is work as consumers in a way that I call in, vito, in vivo conservation. And that is eating foods to save them. It is the responsibility of every single one of us and I think like the greatest, most delicious challenge to eat in a diversified way. This is way more interesting to me than swapping out light bulbs or stuffing insulation into cracks in my windows. This is where I want to do the work and this is what I want to tell people to pay attention to. Not to the exclusion of those other things, but I believe what we've not done is activated the imagination and the memory, right? And the deliciousness of what environmental and sustainability engagement is all about. And this is it right here. Criollo is one of the most, um, is one of the rarest forms of chocolate available. It is also the most delicious thing I've ever tasted. I've never had any chocolate like this in my life. You know, I was eating Yorkies and, you know, like Cadbury's this and Mars that and all these chocolates. And, you know, occasionally I'd eat a nicer bar of chocolate, but really chocolate to me was chocolate, right? It was just the thing that got me through the good times and the bad. And then I started paying attention. And then I started being grateful when I started to understand where these things were coming from and how precious they were, how amazing it was that they got to me. So to come back to this list, all the socioeconomic changes um, are what we can see is kind of the overarching what you don't see here, right? We could put all of these under that umbrella, right? And that includes changes not only in uh, culinary preparation, as I referenced, but changes in taste, demand, and diet. Right? Because we cook less and on a personal scale, we grow less. We grow fewer foods. We can't miss what we don't know. But you can't leave this room now not knowing this information. So what I hope is that you will carry this information away with you and you will start to pay attention to the provenance of your foods and to consider where it is that they come from and how it is that they are grown. I had a vague idea of some farmer who's had the skin color like mine in some far-flung country growing my food and I was grateful for that. But now I understand that farmer is only able to do what she probably she or he does, because of the biodiversity across the system, from soil to seed to pollinator, then to crop. From the diversity that exists not only in the kinds of foods that we are able to grow, but in the kinds of agricultural systems that we are able to sustain. Um, this, I think, is a good way to start to wrap things up. Um, this is the homogenization of our diet captured through McDonald's across the world. So this is kind of um, the choice that we have every single day in the decisions that we make. We can move towards the more homogenized system or we can start to celebrate the culinary diversity that we have. And by extension, celebrating on the plate will trace us all the way back to the soil and the seed. Uh, and I want to make clear, this isn't something that's just happening in McDonald's. This is a map also from Cornucopia Institute of what's happening in the organic food sector. Um, and I think all these slides are gonna be available for you. So you are more than welcome to take a look at this later. The consolidation of our food system is universal and is happening in real time. So does anyone know what this is? It's coffee, right? And to me, this is kind of says everything. That the thing that wakes me up every single day, I didn't know what it looked like. I couldn't have found it in nature to save my life. <laughs> and now I can. Those are the cherries that I referenced earlier. And this is the journey it makes. The, the things that we call beans are the seeds of the plant, right? And then they are roasted. And then finally, they make our way to us. But everything is a journey, and it starts in a place like this. So I 
Thank you for joining me on this journey today. I commend you for the work that you're doing, and uh, I look forward to any questions you may have. <laughs>